Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for our podcast episode. Uh, we are so excited to have um, Linda Ryden and Layla Patterson here. Um, I guess first question, if you could all just like introduce yourself, brief over overview of your experience working in schools, your interests um, and background in conflict resolution and peace processes. Um, we can start with Layla. Great. Thank you. No, happy to be here. I'm Leela Peterson. I'm executive director of um, School Talk, which is a local nonprofit here in DC that primarily focuses on restorative justice and inclusive education. Um, I've been at School Talk since 2008 when it was created. My background is actually conflict resolution. That's what I have my master's degree in. And I have a specialty in organizational and interpersonal conflict. And so School Talk was actually created to help um, because back in the day, DC had more special education due process hearings than all the rest of the states combined. So School Talk was actually created to help schools and families. Um, and we also said students um, to work together like more effectively, particularly around the area of disability. Um, but since then we've expanded. Um, but our work has been both in terms of helping at the school level, um, but also community, and then also at the systems change level, which are all really key pieces to conflict resolution. Yeah, thank you so much. Linda? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Linda Ryden, and I am the creative director of Peace of Mind. And for 20 years, uh, starting in 2003 um, until 2023, I was the peace teacher at uh, Lafayette Elementary School in DCPS. And um, during that time, I created the Peace of Mind curriculum, which teaches kids about mindfulness, brain science, conflict resolution, and social justice. And so we have a curriculum that I've written um, that goes from pre-K to eighth grade, we're currently sort of looking at um, creating a high school curriculum. And we have uh, our programs gone from being in one school um, to being in, I think, 30 something schools in DC area and in schools in 44 states, uh, which is really exciting. Um, and I stopped teaching in uh, 2023 and joined uh, my partner, Cheryl Dodwell, um, who's the executive director of Peace of Mind. I joined her uh, full-time with Peace of Mind in uh, the summer of 2023. And since then, we've really focused on uh, training teachers to use the curriculum, to learn about brain science, to learn about mindfulness, to learn about how those can be the, the um, a really solid foundation for learning about conflict resolution and social justice. So, uh, yeah, long, long time in the classroom. Um, I'm, I have to say, I'm sort of enjoying the, the freedom of <laughs> being at in my house at nine o'clock on a Friday morning, but, uh, but I sure do miss teaching. That's great. Wow. Yeah, that's a big transition to go through. That's been pretty recent in that way. But yeah. what, I, I think like what a gift to be able to take all that classroom experience because like, you really know what teachers are going through in those moments and what students are, how they're showing up in those moments too. So like what experience to be able to offer to, to what you're teaching too. Yeah, it's fun because now I can go to other schools and see what's happening, which I never could do before. So I'm, I'm meeting teachers in lots of different environments and hearing about what, what their experience is like. Well, let's take a minute to talk about our terms, because a trend that I have noticed in the schools that we work in is that people don't, they understand that punitive things don't work as well as they want them to work, that there's like a change in that. But I, what I find is people are like, we need restorative, we need restorative. And, mm -hmm. and I, what I feel like is in that, like that, that it implies a lot of different things. And I think under that umbrella would be like actual restorative justice, conflict resolution, mindfulness. So can, can we define what some of the differences in these terms are? And um, Leila, let's start with you in the difference between conflict resolution and restorative justice and the similarities. Yeah, um, well, I mean, I think, I mean, conflict is a natural part of life, right? Like if we're gonna especially be around people of differences when, you know, and just the, you know, I mean, human beings, are, we're just complex and complicated and everything. Then if you throw in different 
cultural norms, different personal backgrounds or whatever, right? So conflict is a natural part of life. So we have to have ways, and it's how we respond to conflict, right? That prevents, you know, things from escalating or prevents, you know, or mitigates, you know, like harm to relationships, all sorts of things. So restorative justice is essentially both a sort of framework and philosophy for helping with like relationships, addressing harm, addressing conflict resolution, but also has processes that help with that. So there are many other ways to both prevent conflict, um, but then also like address it um, and, you know, and also address like harm. So I mean, I think restorative justice is just like kind of one way and one frame um, that gives us way of thinking about how to be in relationship with each other. Um, so you could like, so any organization, any relationship can have other ways to address conflict. You can, um, both in terms of like skills that you can take on like individually to just help you be able to listen better or to regulate your own emotions, um, but then also to have difficult conversations across like an interpersonal or larger like community. So restorative justice is is a sort of like a means of conflict resolution, but also, like I said, sort of a philosophy around it. And you can use restorative justice to both like build community, establish norms that can prevent conflict, but then you can also use it to have those difficult conversations um, when either something has occurred um, or um, there, uh, you know, there's just like complex stuff going on. You can use it both with students, but then also um, as like you've all, you know, seen also a lot of schools are using in DC are using restorative justice to also address adult challenges. Yeah, I, I like how you say that conflict is just a part of being human. Uh, Cause I, I do, I do think it, it is. And we all, it's like we either learn conflict resolution or conflict, like not non-resolution in our families growing up about how this is treated. So I feel like so many of us are coming into these environments, having some modeling that might be functional, might be dysfunctional in that way. But to understand that the, I think it's a really healthy part of being a human being too, to be able to work with uh, addressing conflict and the growth that's uh, potential there. So I, I like just, to kind of admitting that this is like really necessary and important for all of us. Um, Linda, what about you when you think about the work that you do, especially around mindfulness and peace processes and conflict? What do, how do you see the relationship there? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because when I started the program, uh, it was right in the aftermath of 9-11. And I was really trying to think of, of ways to respond and give kids a chance to learn about how to make the world a more peaceful place and how to resolve conflict without violence. And, and at that time, also at our school, we were having a, a pretty huge problem with fighting and the kids just seemed really out of control. And it was parents were up in arms and teachers were up in arms. And so I was sort of creating this program in response to those that environment. And so I thought, you know, I'll teach conflict resolution. That seems like the, the way to go. And I, I had a lot of good resources. I, I felt like I was teaching well, and the kids were getting a weekly class in conflict resolution. And what I noticed was that it just didn't work, that the kids would, they knew how to work out conflicts in class, and then they'd go back out to recess and they'd all get into fights. And so, uh, and I, I remember when, day I was in my classroom and some kids got sent to me after recess and they were furious and they'd been in a big fight. And I was like, guys, why didn't you use the conflict resolution skills I taught you? And they're like, they were like, oh, Miss Ryden, I was so mad. I couldn't remember anything you said. And I was like, and it just was like one of those aha moments where I was like, what, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing wrong? And so I realized that in, in a lot of the books that I had been reading about conflict resolution, it would say like, you know, here's a three-step process. And, you know, step one was calm down. Step two was start working on your conflict resolution. And I realized that they, there was never any guidance in step one. There was no advice about how to calm down. It was just calm down. And I thought, well, that's the hard part. Like the other parts <laughs> are not that hard. <laughs> so <You know>? true. 
Right. And so I, that's when I really set out to figure out how I could teach kids to calm down. And, and again, this was the early 2000s. Mindfulness was not everywhere. And so teaching about teaching kids mindfulness at school was a pretty weird thing to do. And, um, but it really seemed like the more I read about it, that, um, that that would help. And so I got some training, I started practicing myself. And I went into school and started teaching my full breathing practices. And the kids really loved it, were very open to it. My colleagues pretty much thought it was, it was pretty weird. But, um, but I persevered. And uh, we started noticing a really big difference when I started teaching the mindfulness practices, making them part of my lessons, teaching that as like sort of a, uh, a precursor to the conflict resolution. We started to see the, the incidences of kids fighting on the playground go way down. And, and it was dramatic. And uh, so I really started to think about why that was true. Like, why did these mindful breathing practices help so much? I started to read at that point, there was more and more being written about brain science. And so I started to read more about the, the brains of children and, and adolescents and adults and starting to understand like what happens in your brain when you get angry. And what I realized was that the kids that day who had been describing to me that, you know, that they were too angry to think they were describing exactly what happens in your brain. That when, you know, you have this prefrontal cortex that's in charge of executive function and it's in charge of all your thinking. But when you get angry, there's another part of your brain called the amygdala, which is there to protect you, right? It's, it's, it's your security guard. It's watching out for danger. If it thinks you're in danger, it's going to shut down the part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex that thinks, and it shuts down the hippocampus that remembers things. And so it's, you're just, you're completely being controlled by this, this part of your brain that can only really do three things. It can fight, it can run away, or it can freeze. And so that's what we were seeing at recess. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I need you know, like, ah, uh, but so I started to teach the brain science to kids too. So when I started teaching mindfulness and brain science and then getting into conflict resolution lessons, it, it was so much easier. And the kids, so then we saw kids on the playground using conflict resolution skills, mostly to prevent a conflict from escalating in the first place. We weren't even spending very much time de-escalating. Kids would say to each other, oh, you're going up the conflict escalator, you know, like take some deep breaths. And, you know, it, I mean, and it sounds like, you know, it doesn't sound realistic, but they actually did it. And even if they would do it kind of in a joke, you know, they're like, you better take deep breaths. And then, you know, but they knew what they needed. And, and they, and all the kids at the class, all the kids at my school took the same class. So they all had this common language and they could help each other. Um, so to me that like, that totally transformed the way that I thought about conflict resolution and the way I wanted to teach conflict resolution. So it's like Layla was saying, like it, there's like restorative practices. Like res I'm, I didn't have that term back when I was starting it, but it's kind of what we were doing. You know, a big part of our classes are building community and teaching kids about how to be kind to people that they don't like. And, and, the importance of compassion. And, and so like all these different things, conflict resolution training is a piece of that, but it can't be st a standalone. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And I, I always love when you tell that story as well, because it makes me think of, I mean, I had this one student and when I was in the classroom, I had no training at all on any of this. Um, I like knew the buzzwords and I was like, okay, I know I'm supposed to do this. I don't know how to do it. And I was like, I know this student has like, he had a whole library of mindfulness techniques and like, he didn't have sequentially the next step, which was the conflict resolution stuff. And so I was like, why is he still having all of these conflicts? Because you need both pieces. And I didn't feel equipped to teach either. Um, and so, and I think also just considering like terms, just the the name, your title um, at Lafayette, right, was peace teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and I'm sure Layla, you as well get into this too, where sometimes people like their shoulders 
rise up. They get a little like tense when they hear like restorative justice, but it's like, these are concepts that we do every day and just like naming them. Sometimes I think uh, people put up a guardrail against that. Um, Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I think, go ahead. No, go ahead, please, Layla. No, I was just going to say, I think you know, one of the things, Linda, that you just said about having a common language, I think that can be so hope, helpful. So restorative justice can actually give some common language. Mindfulness can, but there's also other things because it's, it, it, you know, again, if conflict is a natural part of life, then every relationship, every organization, every community ends up sort of building patterns, ways of dealing with it. And we can make more intentional choices to make those sort of more like healthy for human beings and like positive relationships. Um, And so, you know, and I think like the other sort of point, I think just like tease out, I think of what all of us are saying is that like conflict resolution, we always think of conflict resolution as what happens like at the end when there's like a fight. But like, Mm -hmm. you know, if you think of dealing with conflict in a holistic way it's everything from what we do individually like with mindfulness or you know how we are what we can do to prevent it and um in terms of the community building but then there's also going to be times when like you know Gracie like you and I have a disagreement but like are we able to just like work it through ourselves or sometimes we might not be able to do it because like we might be at a standstill with just us so we need like a third person or other structure to help us have you know and then sometimes things have to go and like a principal has to decide or a judge has to decide so if we like think about how to make you know, and sometimes it's a system change. So like, I always like to think of it also as this sort of like continuum and like, we need to have effective and good skills and practices and understanding about like what we can do at each stage of conflict in order to like reduce the harm and just to be more effective. Um, so, you know, anyway, so that's, that's something that I like often, especially in the work of like working with schools or organizations or even individuals, like what can we do to at all stages of that? Because there will be conflicts at all of those. We can't make conflict not happen. Like that's yeah. not possible. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right there. And I think that segues really nicely into our next question, which is just how do we build buy-in with educators, right? With the adult culture, because if the educators are not fully bought in, if they don't have the language, if they don't practice this interrelationally among the staff, um, then this project doesn't really get off the ground. Um, Conflict resolution, restorative justice, it's hard to make those work when you don't have the structural or the adult buy-in. And I know that you both do a lot of work with adults um, to really level set there. So why why is it important to help educators manage their conflict um, in the school building and outside of the school building? Uh, And we can start with Leila. Okay, well, I mean, I think, Most importantly, your educators and your adults in the building are going to leave if you're not effectively managing conflict. There's actually been a lot of research about looking at like why, like teacher turnover rates. And a lot of times it actually comes down to feeling like there's all this conflict that's not being addressed or just the harm that it's done from it. And it might be conflict sort of within, you know, sort of peers and other educators. It could be dealing with conflict with, you know, families. Um, you know, whatever, but that conflict is something that like drives people from schools or even from the field of education. So, you know, I think that's really important. And then another thing is like, you have to deal with it effectively to keep it from escalating because like, there's all sorts of things that change as conflict escalate in terms of like, um, you know, like more people get involved and with social media and everything like, it, like like a lot of people getting involved really fast, which will make the situation so much more difficult to deal with. Another thing that dynamic that happens is that like issues that need to be addressed to resolve the conflict go from like a specific, you know, thing like, you know, who's assigned to what or a difference in, um, you know, how to deal with something to more general, like you don't respect me or, um, you know, you're shutting me out. And that kind of thing is so much harder to deal with than the like, okay, who's going to do what, when kind of thing. 
So anyway, the longer you don't deal with it, if you don't deal with it effectively, the harder it gets because there's more people involved, issues are more general. Um, you know, people don't think that it's possible to resolve it. So people like really step back often. So anyway, I could, I could go on and on about that. Um, but it definitely, you know, and I just one last thing about that. I mean, the environments that so many of our schools are working in right now are so hard. And so like the adult piece of it is often like neglected because the focus is on the students and the harm it does um, and just the mental and emotional um, toll that it takes on, you know, the people that are leading the schools, the people, you know, the teachers who are in the classrooms, um, just I don't think can be overstated. Yeah, thank well, I you. agree with that 100%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just having just, you know, come out of 20 years in DCPS. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I so many people leave. I mean, it's really, it's so sad. And um, and and seems just so unnecessary. I mean, there's some things that we can't help, and then there's a lot of things that could just be a lot better. And um, I mean, I you were asking about buy-in, and I mean, I when I first started trying to convince the adults in the building that what I was doing was important, it, it was hard. You know, I mean, people really a lot of um, a lot of teachers have been sort of almost. Um, I think the expectation was so much like you leave your feelings at home and you're focused on your work. And, you know, and we know that that's not possible and um, or that they, you know, they kind of felt like, well, dealing with feelings is sort of the counselor's job and my job is academics. And, and so when I, when I'll describe like the, the brain science to a teacher in terms of like what you see in the classroom, you know, if you see, if there's a, a student you know, and you, you're giving a math test and the student is sitting there at their desk, if they don't know the answers for whatever reason, they're, they're going to start to feel like they're in danger. And, and I remember this as a kid completely. And so, you know, you might see a kid get, you know, look at the paper and then suddenly they like crumble it up and throw it on the floor and they start making um, a scene. Right. And they're so they're in fight mode that like their amygdala has taken over their brain. They're in fight mode or or the kid who suddenly has to go to the bathroom and won't come back. You know, they've they're they're in flight mode. And or this is this would be me when I was a kid. I would just go into freeze mode and I would just sit there and stare at the paper and not do the test because I didn't know. And I would say, you know, the part of the brain that a, a kid needs to do the math test is their prefrontal cortex or their hippocampus. You know, the, the, they want to remember the answers. They need to be able to figure it out. That part of their brain is completely shut off. So if they cannot do the work. So, you know, so when you're a teacher and you're just like, oh my God, like this kid won't do the test. Like, ah, you know, if you, you know, I always say like, if you could just spend a little bit of time before the test, letting them do some breathing or acknowledge what's happening in their brains and remind them that the, they need the, their prefrontal cortex to be in charge in order to take the test, then you're all kind of on the same team. Like we know we all have brains. We know we all have feelings. We know that sometimes it's stressful to take a test, whatever it is, even if you know the answers. So then, you know, I'll kind of, I, 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 I saw a lot of people sort of go, oh, oh, because this is, it's helpful to the teacher for the children to know this stuff. And it's helpful for the teacher to know this stuff for themselves. I mean, I I have my pre-mindfulness brain science teacher self and my post-mindfulness brain science teacher self. And it's dramatically different. My happiness level was dramatically different because before, like you were saying, Caroline, like I kind of knew what to do. I didn't know how to do it. And most of the time we kind of go back to what we saw when we were in school and we treat the kids the way we were treated. And that, then that usually wasn't great. Um, and you're always in a power struggle with kids and it's just, you know, it's terrible, but if you can notice when you're getting frustrated or angry, or you feel like you're in danger because, you know, there's always that one kid who's trying to, to blow up your lesson, <laughs> you know, and it's perfectly crafted and it was going to go great. And then, you know, one person can kind of derail the whole thing as a teacher, you can feel threatened 
and your brain can, can interpret that as danger. So then if the teacher is in fight or flight mode, then you're really in trouble. And then you have a lot of student teacher conflict that is a huge problem, can be very dangerous and very destabilizing for all the relationships in the room. So I think um, it, it was helpful for me to be able to, to talk about it, not even so much as self-care, because I think a, a lot of the times teachers were just like hearing so much about like, oh, you have to do self-care, <laughs> you know, and they're like, well, sure, but who's going to actually help me with the things that are stressing me out? Um, and, and, but the, 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 these are actual tools that will help to make your job easier. Um, that, that seemed to really help people to come and kind of come around to it. Thank you. I Can I very quickly, Gracie, before you jump in, I think, Linda, your comments are also making me think about how, I mean, like organizational culture in a school too, right, can cause educators to feel threatened and can cause educators to like sort of go into that fear response, um, just feeling like constantly, I'm constantly being evaluated. I'm constantly on the line. Um, and so I think like having the tools, not only to teach your students, to, but to recognize in yourself, like, oh my gosh, this is the reaction I have when, um, I'm being evaluated. This is the reaction I have when an, ad an administrator is in the room or something like that can really help like regulate, like, okay, I'm safe. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, these are my patterns. What do I need to do to resolve them? Um, but I will hand it to Gracie. Yeah, well, I was I was thinking in the same line because I'm thinking about how this plays out in our partner work in schools and where people seem to get really stuck in this process. And Linda, you talked about power struggles and that that was resonant. Um, and I also think about the role of hierarchy and um, and I think hierarchy within just like a school level and a staff organizational chart level, but also the hierarchy within like a system like DCPS too of just um, decisions that are really meaningful to well-being in the classroom being up to completely out of your hands sometimes and the stress that that causes. So I, I'd like to hear from both of you of where you kind of see this really beautiful process getting stuck in real time in schools and just anything that you could advise or that if you had a, your magic conflict resolution fairy wand, like what would you do to be able to, to wave that wand? And let's, let's start with you, Linda, and then we'll go to Layla. Hmm. Um, I think, I mean, I feel like a broken record, but I think where people get stuck in conflict resolution is, is always beforehand. You know, it's, it's the, it is the emotional regulation part. And, um, so many conflicts. Could, I think, you know, I just think some, not the conflict could be, could be, um, avoided but the but the conflict escalation could be avoided if if people could just take a moment like like you said caroline like recognizing your your patterns um and i i mean i i i can't tell you how often i have these like aha moments about things that i teach all the time you know i mean i i wrote a book about this and i still every once in a while i, I had a administrator once who really triggered me and and I realized that like whenever I was around that person I just kind of couldn't talk and I you know I would walk out and I'd think ah oh, I should have said this or that you know and I would think about it all night long all the things I should have said and I was like and then I suddenly realized like oh I was in freeze mode you know like I like I I I was triggered when I was around that person and and I'm thinking like I should have known that. I mean, it, but it, it's hard and you really do need to, it's not, it's, you can't just be sort of told these things. You have to experience them. You have to practice them. Um, I I have what, one of the things that happens when we go into schools to talk about the issues that, that teachers are seeing, you know, it's, and it's almost always the same Thing. Well, it's always one or two things. Like either either the teachers will say all the kids at our school are super anxious and really like high achieving parents, and they just are expecting too much of the kids, and they're so perfectionist they can't they're frozen they can't do anything. Or we'll hear that the kids are completely dysregulated and fighting all the time, and that's kind of it. And and so, but people, if we go to the the schools where they say the kids are fighting all the time, they're 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 like can we just go straight to the conflict resolution lessons? Like they don't want to do the, 
three or four months of learning about mindfulness and brain science and practicing mindfulness every week. And so, and I'm always like, I mean, you can, but it, it, I can tell you, it's not going to work. Like, I mean, I did that. <laughs> I tried that. It doesn't work. And you do have to sort of build this foundation and, and it really does have to be like, like every day, a little bit to remind people, remind people so that, that, you know, we all know that like when we're angry, if somebody says like, you need to calm down, you should take a deep breath. It's like the last thing you want to do and it'll make you more angry. But if, if thinking about that is something that you do every day, then you're, then it's a tool you have inside. And so you as an adult or as a student can say like, oh, I'm getting angry. I, I know how to take deep breaths or whatever. So we're, I think people just, they want, they just want to not have the conflicts. And I think like Layla said, the conflicts are important. They're, they're a part of life. It's important to understand, I think, um, that, that some conflicts are really worth sort of fighting for. Um, but it depends on how you're fighting for them. And we'll, you know, I talk a lot about the civil rights movement and, and nonviolent disobedience and like those, like it's, it's strong and powerful to stand up for what you believe in a way that is regulated. Like the, the people could have going off like half cocked, like uh, with their amygdala fully in charge and their body filled with stress hormones are not effective communicators for their cause. Um, and so if you really want to be strong and you want to fight for something that you really believe in and being uh, being led by your, the thinking part of your brain, not being able to be triggered by anybody who says something to you to throw you off is that that's a position of, of real power. Um, and so when I can sort of explain that, that can help get more people interested in that and realize that it, it, it does take a bit of time to get there, but it's worth it. And so, I mean, I think the word conflict actually gets people stuck because so many of our cultural backgrounds or especially in a workplace situation, conflict is bad. So if you admit that you're in conflict or that there is a conflict, then somebody must have done something wrong, right? Yeah. Because we should be able to prevent there from being conflict. So I think even naming it as conflicts, that's why you also see all sorts of different words, like working across differences, having difficult conversations, communication challenges. Like we have all sorts of like other ways to like express that because just even the word conflict, I think can be hard. Um, the other thing is like of all the different types of conflict that are out there, I actually think workplace and so like, again, we're, since we're focusing this podcast on the adult piece, I mean, I think workplace conflict is one of the hardest things because you know like our identities are part of like our work our livelihoods there's also like you know the power structure the organizational culture that we might not like have a lot of um uh you know ways to like impact um you know I feel like there is so much pressure put on schools to be everything to everyone um and so like well, workplace conflict in general, I think is difficult. I mean, I do think with schools, it's like very difficult. So I think like we shouldn't think that this is an easy thing, right? With easy answers or if someone, you know, if a principal would just like communicate better or if this teacher would just do this differently, then we wouldn't have any problems mm -hmm. um, because there is so much going on and we don't have a lot of, you know, we don't have control over who we work with, right? Either. So, you know, I think that like um, just understanding that as well as, you know, I think it was Lynn or I think several of you have actually, I think maybe all of us have brought up that also how our personal backgrounds and experience and lived experiences impact how we're able to function um, and our, what our expectations are too about the patterns that exist or like who should do what. Um, you know, when there's a difficult situation. Um, and so, you know, but like in a workplace, you can't share and like process like all those personal things necessarily. Um, so it, it's just, there's a lot going on. And so I think, 
that's where like sort of the giving ourselves grace, um, you know, and giving other people grace. Um, you know, there's a quote, you know, like listening is the most, can be the most effective part of conf or uh, effective conflict resolution process, you know, and, um, but I think like Linda, to your point that you've been making, you can't listen if you're totally triggered, like your brain doesn't allow you to actually even listen. So how can we, if we know we're operating in really high conflict places, like a lot of our schools are, what, do, what is the work that we need to do as an adult so we can be in that listening space and create that sense of peace or, you know, whatever to help other people, you know, to be there as well. Mm. I, I I mean, again, you're ahead of the curve, Layla, because our next question is actually about like how identity plays into these conflict resolution measures and like how we inhabit those processes. Um, I think so. I think for many of us, when we're dealing with like scary words like conflict, because you're right, they can be scary. That's just the way we're socialized, many of us. Um, and I think it's really important to have a conversation about like how we can make those culturally responsive, right? Because for many of us, when we hear conflict, we also experience like the additional level of, of stereotype threat um, and things of that nature. Like I know I was implicitly taught at home not to bring my emotions to school, to work, to any of that uh, for that reason. Um, and so I think I would love to hear from both of you how we can make these processes like really participatory and culturally responsive so that it's safe for people to show up um, in their identities in this work. And I'm just gonna leave that open, whoever wants to take that first, because I know it's a big question. Do you wanna jump in, Linda? Or do you... Uh, you look like you're ready, but if you're not ready, go ahead. Yeah, so I guess, like there are a couple of things that like I always try and do or to, to think about like, and one is just the actual physical space, right? Like is the space that you're trying to like, you know, approach or talk to someone about like a space that is not just like empowering one person, right? Like, does it feel like safe? And I think, you know, and is it feel comfortable? I mean, I think we are impacted so much by our physical spaces. Um, and so, you know, like one of the things I like that seeing is like how many schools are like really thinking about that, like creating peace rooms or realizing if you're trying to like do restorative work, but then you have it where people are like getting like used to being called in to be suspended or like the principal's office, like that might not be the best, you know, place. Um, so I think just like the phys paying attention to the physical space, um, I mean, people can even be triggered coming into like a school building. So like, is there another place to like do things? Um, another thing is like, you know, when something to a point where you sort of need somebody to help have the conversation, who is that person? Or can you have somebody that is more like representative or understanding be a part of the process too. So it's like sort of who's leading a process and who else is present can be a big thing in terms of being culturally um, responsive. Um, and then, you know, I think also like a lot of like in restorative practices, um, you know, a lot of times people think that the prep is sort of optional if you're doing more of like those responsive types of restorative processes and stuff like that. And it's not because part of what you're trying to understand prior to um, having people sit down is what are the like potential cultural, you know, differences or needs um, that need to be like present. So those are just some like, you know, sort of concrete, like very practical things. Um, but I think it's just like knowing but I think for anybody who's trying to do this work, understanding how significant, you know, Carolyn, like you were saying, how significant the cultural piece can be and just really being attentional about like every step of like sort of interrogating your own like processes and assumptions to see whether or, or not that is then shutting someone down or creating a power dynamic that will be harmful to people moving forward together. 
Yeah, I'm like writing down so many things you're saying, Layla. <laughs> things I things I want to ask you about. Um, yeah, I think it's it's interesting to like one of the reasons that um we have a social justice component to the curriculum is because we we don't we don't want to get I think I referenced this earlier, like with teachers, you know, we all know like how difficult teachers situations are. And then, you know, I, I remember this, especially during the pandemic, you know, it was just this constant barrage of like, well, you need to, to you need to do self-care, just do self-care, you know? And, and I, I find, and people would call on me all the time, like, oh, could you do a training for teachers on mindfulness, whatever. And I finally just was like, I'm not doing it anymore because I don't want to be part of this because there was, nobody wanted to talk and nobody, you know what I mean? But nobody wanted to talk about what was causing teachers to feel so stressed and to causing the burnout. And, and really people weren't wanting to take anything off of teachers' plates in order to maybe give them a little more balance in their lives. And so like a mindfulness practice is a great thing and it can really help, but it's not a, it's not something you do instead of trying to address the root causes of the problems in a school system. And so I feel the same way about children. Like, I think that it, it, the children who take our classes, I want, I want them to have tools that they can use to help them cope with the world that they're living in. And if the if they're experience if they're experiencing a world that is um you know where the that where the odds are stacked against them i i i don't want them to just have more skills so they can cope with a worse world than another child is is coping with i want them to have those skills but also understand that that why why they feel that way like you know if they're if they're experiencing racism i want them to know like this isn't your fault like the problem is not your the color of your skin the problem is the attitudes of the people around you and we can work to change those we do a lot of work on on learning about stereotypes and using um the mindfulness practices about metacognition to sort of look at your own thoughts and to to think about stereotypes and like, where did these ideas come from and how did they get into your mind? And why do you, when you look at somebody, why do you think you know things about them based on what they look like or what they're wearing or whatever? Um, and we really try to interrogate those things because that it's, it's so important that we're not sort of gaslighting kids to thinking like, Oh, you can just breathe away racism and breathe away all the problems, you know, poverty and inequality. Like that's, that's not true. These are, these are tools that, that help you deal with a world um, and the, the big and small problems that are, that exist, but we don't want kids to think that they're the problem. And I think that and the same is true for teachers. I think teachers think like, well, if I was just working harder I would be able to do all of these things that I'm being asked to do. And, and the reality is you can't, like nobody can do all those things that, that teachers are being asked to do. And, and while it's incredibly important to address the wellness of teachers, it's, it's also as part of that package, which I think is so cool that Empower Ed is doing this because you're, you're fighting for teachers and you're trying to, help and take care of teachers at the same time. It's, it's, it's such a beautiful thing because it all goes together. Like, I think it seems very similar to what we're trying to do in peace of mind. Um, it, there's just not one thing. You can't just do one thing to solve these problems. And um, uh, I think I might've lost the thread here, but, um, <laughs> but I get so, I don't know. I feel so passionately about this, but I think it's just, it's important that we, that we put these things in context so that that people understand their their role and and how much they can they can do by themselves and how much you can do in in community and and you can't do any of it unless you're like aware that it's happening thank you i, I love the passion and <laughs> yeah the, the umbrella wellness is big and i i love that about using the term wellness in schools cuz it can mean a lot of different things and it can mean conflict resolution it can mean you know a massage therapist waiting 
and staff lounge. It can mean a social justice framework to be able to really understand and track what's happening in the moment. And I think I think pretty much everyone's like, yeah, wellness, even if they might be like conflict, ah, racism, <laughs> like I want to talk about that. So I, I, I think it, and it is all feeds into our wellness about seeing it as like we're these big, complicated, beautiful bumbling beings in this world and like that wellness like encapsulates all of that of like us being able to like accept ourselves and work on ourselves at the same time Mm -hmm. um so I'd love to just um end here with like a last word of like what like if like one statement you feel like you really want people to understand about conflict resolution or mindfulness or like the work that you do or what you've learned about it and um Caroline you and I are gonna go in this too (laughs) but I'll, I'll go first um I, re- I really feel like what I've learned in my life is that the relationships where I can go through conflict and where we're brave enough to do that, like those are my best relationships. Like those are the ones that feel like ultimately, even though like I've gone through some of my scariest moments on those relationships, those are the ones I feel the safest in because I feel like no matter what happens, we can sort of like we have the tools and the like willingness to deal with that. And those are the ones that are like enduring in my lifetime. So that's that's my like last word about that. I'll let anyone jump in who's ready. <laughs> I can follow up briefly. I think very similar to that. I think I sort of like internalized when I was younger that like, if I cannot resolve a conflict on my own, it's a personal failing. Um, Instead of thinking of it as like, no, I need to like do the work of like relation building with other people in order to resolve this conflict together in community. Um, And so I think that's something as well that that I'm learning. So thank you for this conversation. Uh, so it's so hard to think of one thing to say across a million. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, and just in the following up on, on your personal statements, I think that, I mean, I grew up very conflict averse and like we were not allowed to have conflict in my family and people didn't directly talk about things. And, um, and so I think it's it's um, interesting that this is what uh, one of the things that I focus on in my in my life. Um, but I do think that that people are constantly dealing with conflict. I mean, it's that is just a fact of life, and so having some skills to use and to draw on sort of can make it all seem less scary and, and it can lead to building bridges, um, and, and, you know, movement forward in our, in our, uh, society, if we deal with things, like if we, if we hide from things, if we avoid the conflicts, we're not going to make any kind of, um, real change. And so I feel like I, like overcoming that, aversion and, and saying like, okay, I I will get into this, but in a, in a way that is skillful and compassionate is, is something that has changed my life for the better. And I, and I think given a lot of tools to the kids that I've worked with. So, but it's hard. I don't like it. (laughs) I don't don't like, I still don't like conflict. I think Linda, I'm in a similar situation where I have so many thoughts, Um, but I think, I think what I'm thinking about this moment, Linda, is like just what you said a few minutes ago about how like you've written a book about this, you've written this curriculum that's like so impactful and you still have like personal learning moments for yourself in it. And I feel so much about that with like, you know, conflict for myself, you know, like my personal just dealing with some conflict resolution because we do have to do it every day. And at the same time, we're also always like, learning about like ourselves or learning different ways and things about it and like it is hard and it is humbling I think to try and do this work and to try and have an impact um in it um but I think like just sort of being you know especially like when we're trying to teach kids you know like I feel like so much of the dynamic in schools is like oh well we're going to teach kids to do this and then we as adults like don't aren't doing anything that we're like 
yep. you know, <laughs> telling kids. So I don't know. I think that's, it, that's just that it's like, this is hard. And, you know, even though like, you know, it's, I built my professional career around this. I feel like I'm still like humbled like every day about it, like both personally and then also with like how hard like the work is. Yeah, I appreciate Same. that a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Layla. Um, it's been a really inspiring conversation. And um, as always in these conversations, I just feel very big and very central. And um, just it's meaningful to take the time to slow down and articulate like what, what we're really talking about when we use these terms. And so we appreciate you. We appreciate your work. And thank you to everyone who listens. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye, everyone.